rolling. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, my name is Stacy Krim, and I am talking with Gary Trowbridge and Frank Benedetti for the Pride of the Community Oral History Project. Today is May 21st, 2019. Thank you for talking to us today. It's, it's our pleasure. We're, we are Frank and Gary, and we tell uh, new people that we meet that it's very easy to remember our names because we are two gay guys, Frank and Gary, F-A-G. <laughs> and, and they, you, you even told the governor. I told the governor that. <coughs> which governor? Governor Cooper. Governor Cooper. Oh, awesome. Yeah. And just for the record, which one of you is Frank? And which I'm one Frank. Of you? Okay. The younger one is Gary. <laughs> oh, please. Okay. Okay. So anyway. Uh, <laughs> so youngest to oldest left or right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And we, we both grew up in really opposite parts of the country. I grew up in New York City uh, in a ghetto in South Bronx. And Gary grew up in Augusta, Georgia. And my parents had no education. They didn't even finish high school. They, they did manual stuff. And so it was different. Yet, even though we come from different backgrounds, we both had a lot of things in common. And I think that's what kept us together. So I look upon us as being two sides of a coin, but it was the same coin. When I was growing up in the 50s, it was illegal to serve alcohol to gay people. It was illegal to portray gay people on television, in the movies. Or any on the on the stage, and uh, I when I first came out, I realized that people were meeting in very dark places and, and away from everything. Everybody was very secretive and, and hiding about that, and I never felt comfortable doing that because I had to say, "Why are you doing this? I mean, look at this. We're going. This is a bar. You know, we didn't go in this place in daylight. I would walk right past it anyway. So I never felt comfortable with that, and." Uh, but that's how we grew up, we had a, and, and uh, we both served in the military. I was in the Army and Gary was in the Air Force. And in the military, you have to be very, very careful, uh, particularly before, even before don't ask and don't tell, even before that, because you could be, you could be thrown in jail. You know, what just, period just, were you in the military? I was in, in, in the 60s, okay. early 60s. You, you had it rougher than me because you could have gone to jail. All I had to say is I was following orders. <laughs> I was an enlisted man. He was an officer. Yeah. But I mean, now that you, uh, you face eight years hard labor if they want to throw you out. I mean, so it was terrible. So we both got out about the same time, and we both met in Atlanta. And it was so freeing to be uh, able just to be yourself and not have to hide everything. And we just loved being in Atlanta, and uh, we got along really well. And we both decided early on that what we wanted out of life was a stable relationship. And we didn't care about going to bars. We didn't care about craziness. We just wanted to find someone to grow old with. And that's, that's kind of how we started our relationship. And we lived in an apartment. And then he decided one day that we're going to live in a house. And I said, I've never lived in a house. I've been in an apartment. I call the super when something is wrong. I don't know how to fix anything. And, and he said, oh, we can do that. I said, we have no money. Right? I'll take care of that. So he took care of it. Go ahead. <laughs> I called my mother and asked her. The, the first house we bought was $18,500. That sounds strange. But, uh, and it was $2,000 down. And you assume a loan, which you can't do anymore. Banks won't even let you assume a loan anymore. So my mother loaned us the $2,000. And she said, it was, a, it was like a... 11% interest. I mean, yeah, we had, to sign a, a note. we had to sign a promissory note and we could not mail her any money. She didn't want her current husband of the time to know she had loaned us the money. <laughs> <laughs> she collected then. Uh, so anyway, uh, we saved, Frank said, we're paying her off in a year. So we saved all year long and the 11% interest and we called her and we said, we were ready to pay you. She said, write me a check and I'll bring the note. So she came to, uh, she was living in Augusta. She came to uh, Atlanta. We wrote her a check and gave it to her. And she tore the note up and handed it to us. And then she said, you know, this is about the same amount of money I spent on your sister's wedding. So if you ever decide to marry a woman, you're on your own. And she tore up the check and gave it. So she actually gave us a down payment, but she made us earn it. And uh, that that was our first time. I hadn't lived, I haven't never lived in a house. I was raised in the ghetto. So we I didn't know what a house was. We, we totally redid this house, 
and we were going to Alabama for the weekend to visit a friend and I was taking the dog to the vet. I saw this for sale sign go up in front of this house and I just cut the driveway and ran through the house. <laughs> They said, you can't come in here. I said, oh, this is going to be my house. And I called him and told him what bus to ride and what bus stop to get out. I said, I found you a new house. I said, I like where we are. Well, you're going to love this. <laughs> <laughs> what part of Atlanta were you in? Well, we lived in, uh, on Morningside and Piedmont. And uh, right, the house is still there. Um, and we only paid $22,000 for that. Wow. And about what year was that? Uh, 60... 63, so three years later, 60, about 69. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, that house was, when we moved to Winston, that house, I was a real estate agent in Atlanta at that time. When we moved to Winston, that house was on the market for $660,000. Wow. The timing is everything. <laughs> we should have held on to it. I know, but anyway. But we didn't. We didn't, we didn't. And, and so, but anyway, so we were very happy in Atlanta and we met a lot of people and Atlanta was a very social thing. And I, I think I think that different minorities go through different stages. I think at the early stage, you want to surround yourself with people just like you, and you want to be protected from everybody else. And that's how we were originally. But when we moved here, uh, there was no community to go to, and we said, okay, you know, we need to we need to go out and, and find people. So we decided just to be ourselves and be open about things. And uh, we got hooked up with HRC and with uh, Equality North Carolina. We got hooked up with HRC in Atlanta. In Atlanta, yeah. And, and so we said we would like to go and talk to people, non-gay people, about our lives and present ourselves and answer any kind of questions that they have. But so, about what time did you move to Winston? I would say we, we left Atlanta uh, 93, in 93. So about 95. Yeah, yeah. And so we came, we came, to, we came to Winston not knowing anybody or anything. And uh, so we decided to just join whatever we could join. And I said, I, we, we decided that if we're ever going to find anybody progressive in this new place, there were probably two th areas. One would be if there's a Unitarian church, they're going to be very accepting. And number two, if there were arts groups, because most arts people are very, very progressive. And so we've set about to join every arts group that we could find. And we started off as volunteers, and we would go there and meet people, and always presented ourselves as a couple. We are Frank and Gary, and this is who we are. And we got accepted right away. Uh, we went to the Unitarian Church on Robin Hood Road. We walked in there, and this woman came over. We said, oh my God, are you guys a couple? We said, yes, we are. And she grabbed us and hugged us and kissed us. Oh, welcome, welcome. So we felt very comfortable. And that enabled us to be more open. And when I saw something I didn't like, I would write a letter to the editor. And I would call uh, the, the news stations and say, I think you made a mistake about this. Well, they, after a period of time, they kept calling me back and were asking me to be a spokesperson. I said, I'm not a spokesperson. I'm just telling you what I think. But he said, nobody else will talk to us. Nobody. So I, I would go on television and talk to people. That were different than that. So they would contact us about an issue that concerned the gay community. And I didn't want to be a spokesperson, but nobody would, have, would respond. So by default, mm -hmm. we became spokespeople. Well, that even got people crazier about us. Mm -hmm. you know? And then it was our 25th anniversary. 35th. 35th anniversary, excuse me. Oh God, I get in trouble over this. <laughs> no, that's probably this. In 1963, to, I mean, 1964, to 1999, isn't yeah. that 35 yeah. years? Yeah. So I was reading the paper and I turned to the anniversaries and the birthdays and I saw all these little uh, things. I said, why don't we show our anniversary? He said, well, we, okay, we'll do that. So he called up the newspaper and he said, what do you have to do to celebrate a 30th anniversary? And they said, oh, a check and a picture and right. And that's what we needed. And, and fill this form out. Fill this form out. They sent us a form. We sent them a check. $100 check. And mailed it in. Well, about a week later, we got a call from a, a, a columnist, Kim Underwood. He said, you have no idea what you have done. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? He said, the first person to open your letter said, holy shit, what do I do with this? <laughs> 
And it went all the way up to the publisher. And the publisher said that this is a paid advertisement. We have no regulations preventing this. So we're going to run it. So we became the first same-sex couple in North Carolina to announce their anniversary. Well, Kim Munber said, I've got to come out and meet you guys. So he came out and he said, you realize the danger you're putting yourself in because I know where you live. I and, found I, you. and I found you. And I said, I don't, we don't care. This is who we are. So they did a, a story about us in the paper. Well, my God, all of a sudden, everybody was going crazy. You know, woo -woo, except the gay people were frightened to death of being seen with us. So that, that's fine. It's okay. I don't care. But I'll tell you an interesting story. I want to back a little bit. We moved to Winston-Salem from Atlanta. We had been in Atlanta 30 years. We had support groups. We belonged to many different organizations. We felt very comfortable there. We came to this place not knowing anybody. We purchased a house. After we moved in, we found out that the na some neighbors were taking up a petition to prevent the sale because they didn't want to have two gay men with their children being in the neighborhood. And in 25 years that we lived at that house, no one ever invited us to dinner. They would wave at us, but no one ever got close with us. So that was our welcome to Winston Salem. But I was thinking about my welcome in, in uh, Walmart that night. Oh yeah, he, he, he went to, we went to Walmart. We, said, mm -hmm. okay. we went to Walmart one night. Well, we had just moved here. We didn't know, we didn't know what was going on anywhere. But we went into Walmart, and uh, this family, Hispanic family, was in front of us, and they had a big flatbed truck full of beans and rice and stuff. I mean, they must have been feeding an army. And I'm standing there waiting in line, and this older gentleman's behind me in coveralls and really, you know, kind of farmy looking. <laughs> he said, you know, this Walmart sits always busy. I said, I know. You know, when I was in my 30s living in Atlanta, shopping at Neiman Marcus, I never thought I'd be living up here in my 50s shopping at Walmart. And he said, you know, little buddy, every now and then reality has a way of just coming up and biting you right in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> he deserved it. He deserved it. He that was my welcome. That was his but, I mean, but, but the thing that crowned off everything was... When we had the billboard on 52 and also on Martin Luther King Boulevard by Winston Salem State, the Triad Equality Project did, mm -hmm. and we are your neighbors and we're gay, and our two pictures were up there. And that created a fuss. I mean, so we have we alienated <laughs> everybody in the gay. In the gay. We, we are friendly with a lot of gay people. We are not friends with any. Yeah, we don't have any gay friends. We have lots. And when, and when we, we moved over here, we said we want to make sure that there's no misunderstanding because this is a lot of widows living here. I'm like, oh, two, two men come in here. Oh, my God. You know. We can so, just have our pick. Yeah, so, <laughs> there's, a, there's a newsletter and that they published for the, for the neighborhood. And Gary called up the, the publisher and said, we just moved in and we are probably the only open same-sex couple living here. And we want people to understand this is who we are. Would you like to do a story about us so people, there's no misunderstandings of anything. And uh, they came and did a story on us and they published it. And we couldn't walk out of the house, but somebody said, oh, I have an uncle that's gay. <laughs> and they whisper it to you like, oh my God, you know. One, one woman said, my son's gayer than you are. <laughs> and we just kind of looked, she said, his love was a transgender. <laughs> A transgender. His love is a transgender, so he's really gayer than you are. Oh, you win. <laughs> it's not the a white system. But, yeah, but it, it's and then we had the uh, article Addison Orr wrote. You you know Addison mm -hmm. from Greensboro. Yeah. She wrote an article for Greensboro paper mm -hmm. about the Frankie Gary story, and she said Frank works for Wachovia as a vice president and. And Gary just decided to stay at home and become a domestic goddess. <laughs> <laughs> Wish for life. But I mean, so now that we're living here, we really, really like it. Everybody's been very, and we just, we're friendly people. We like people, like the brown people. And uh, we decided also 
when we moved over here that we would try to talk to people and get out of our comfort zones and just go talk to people. So we have gone around the whole Southeast talking to probably thousands of people in churches and schools. As a matter of fact, uh, two few months ago we were at Salem College and talked to the class on uh, sexuality. But I enjoy doing that and I like doing that and I, I think it helps people understand because we go when they all say, okay, there must be questions that you have. Okay, now please, whatever you ask us, we'll do. One of my favorite things is we went to a Baptist group, <laughs> a book club. First Baptist, First Baptist of fifth, of fifth. Yeah. And I said, uh, my introduced ourselves, and I said, you know, we've been together all these, over half a century, and, and we've seen a lot of things, so any kind of questions you have, please ask. And there was total silence. I said, come on, come on, come on, just ask him. So this guy raised his hand, he says, just exactly what you guys do in bed anyway. <laughs> and I said, we sleep, what do you do? Well, that made everybody laugh. And then they want to know about our family, they want to know about our religion, they want to know about our jobs, you know, how we do it. And what was supposed to be a 20 minute talk was over an hour and a half. And I don't think I changed everybody's minds, but at least I gave them another alternative way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. And that's what we really enjoy doing. And we did that for a long time. Now we are both kind of retired. Yeah, we, we were in Atlanta when, when we were living in Atlanta. We were probably in our 30s, uh, maybe pushing 40. And I can't remember Vic's last name. The guy that started Human Rights Campaign. It was Bissell, called Bissell. Bissell. Yeah. It's called Human Rights Campaign Found, Federation. Well, well, Foundation. Foundation. I think. Foundation, I think. <laughs> And we were having lunch with him, and we were introduced him. We were having lunch. We didn't know him before, and he was explaining what he was trying to set up, and it would become the largest gay uh, and lesbian uh, civil rights place in the whole United States. So, and he was trying to collect money. We, said, we wrote him a check for hundred dollars. We said, "That's a hundred dollars we'll never see again." And look what it, I mean. And it's not just our hundred dollars; it's several people's hundred dollars. Yeah. But look what it's become. And so yeah, exactly. we have had a long association with them. Uh, we used to be Elizabeth Birch's poster boys when she was head of it. Yeah. But she, she got us to to. Uh, she called us up. Elizabeth Birch was head of HRC, and she called us up and she said, uh, "Would you feel comfortable talking to Congress?" And I said, "About what?" <laughs> he, said, he said, "Well, you know." Uh, President Bush is trying to get this uh, marriage lapped, you know, uh, amendment. amendment to the Constitution. And we, we're trying to get people who'll be willing to t tell their stories. I said, yeah, well, yeah, we can go. So we went and we did testify before Congress, uh, a, a subgroup of Congress headed by uh, Senator Cronin of Texas. Texas. And that was one of the most horrible experiences I've ever encountered in my life. But <laughs> we did it. Uh, it was supposed to be eight witnesses. <coughs> so you would think they would be four and four. No, there was five in favor of the Constitutional Amendment and three against it. So it was us, we counted as one, and they had a young man whose partner had been killed in 9-11 living in New York and you cannot live in New York on one salary and they would not give him a death certificate because he had no legal recourse. And Cronin says, well you know, you are the only person to suffer loss. Everybody has suffered loss. People die all the time. I thought that was a cruel thing to say. And why would you say something? I was furious. And he said, sit down. I'm going to throw us out and go rest us. Sit down. But I was really angry. So that that just killed my whole idea about Washington. And then, and then that, what was that woman's name? Maggie Gallagher? The one that was. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and he would, she would go to say something and Cronin would say, I think you mean to say, and he would reword it to where it made more sense because she's a nut. Yeah. But um, it, it, was, it was the most awful thing. <laughs> awful thing. And I thought, oh my God, that really disillusioned me about, about our country. But anyway, so we came back here and we just thought, okay, we're gonna have, we have to work on this now. Well, so, yeah, and we started really hard working on it. Then we got a phone call from HRC. This is how naive we are. We've got you booked on the Ricky Lake show. Yeah. We had no idea who that was. I mean, I didn't even know that she had a talk show. We know who that was. So we said, so, let us watch one first. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, what's going on there? And, and this guy's talking about living on the down low. Yeah. I didn't, we didn't even know what the down low was. We had to find <laughs> out. 
And, uh, and, and he was going to be the guest next day talking about why gays shouldn't marry. And we were going to be the ones talking about why they should marry. And we told Elizabeth, we said, we can't do this. I, I, this man is cheating on his wife. And, and, and this is just, this is terrible. We can't believe this. Yeah. And that decision, I regret. Because I, I, I think you need to go out of your comfort zone. You need to go into other people's territory. And you need to just be yourself and speak honestly. And whether you accept it or not, that's, no, I, re, I regret doing that. I'm yeah, sorry. But you, you, we've been out of our... We have gone as far west as Texas. I mean, into Texas. You spoke in Houston. No, no. Fort Worth. Fort Worth. Okay, we've been as far north as Toledo, Ohio. We've been all over the south. We did this for almost 20 years. Yeah. And we quit when we got equality, on, on marriage equality. And I, I, feel, I feel that uh, the right wing agenda is to try to undo marriage equality. And, and, and I think after, I, after they get through, rid of abortion. Yeah, I, I, think, I think we kind of become, we kind of retired. And see, oh, I have a lot of, he's very supportive of me, but I have, I have a lot of views that a lot of gay people don't want to hear. For example, I don't think there should be such a thing as a gay bar now. Used to be you had no choice because nobody was served with alcohol and you had to hide, you'd be arrested and the cops weren't your friends. They would beat you up or uh, find, and women would be raped by cops. So that was common in New York anyway. So, but I, I think, I, I believe you need to go out into the big, in the real world, I call it the real world. You can't just hide yourself and build a silo around yourself and only be with that. So I'm, I'm against that. I think I'm against gay pride parades that have nudity and, 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 and fantastic costumes. I think that's fun, but I think we have a civil rights problem and we should be marching like the civil rights problems <laughs> and focusing on, on laws and that kind of stuff. So I don't get along with a lot of people who like all the jazz and the feathers and all. And we were asked to be... <laughs> Let me tell you. Okay. <laughs> we, were, we were asked to be the Grand Marshals of the Pride Parade about three or four years ago. And you, you'll be in a convertible. We'll have cushions up there. You'll sit on the back and just wave. Is that okay? So we went and got no, in. No, wait, before a minute, I said, now I want, I want this understood. I, I, I want to be pushing civil rights now. Is this going to be a Mardi Gras parade or is this going to be a civil rights march? It's going to be a civil rights march. And they said, civil rights march, we're going to emphasize marriage equality. I said, okay, we're in. Okay. So a few weeks later, they called and said, do you know Lenny and Pearl? We said, yes. And we knew Pearl was really sick. And uh, they said, well, they would like to be grand marshals also. Do you mind sharing? Do I have two women and two men? We said, no. And jokingly, I said, but we want to be in the front car. Just, it was a, just as a joke. Because they had asked us first. So we get down there for it, and here's this big flatbed thing with this throne up on a dais and these four little folding chairs on the very end of the flatbed truck. And it took us forever to get Pearl up onto this flatbed truck to start with. And she would bruise so easy because, I mean, she was, she was pretty, really sick. And Lenny and Frank and I worked with, it got her up there. And then we were discussing who would sit on the throne. Maybe we'd just take turns sitting on the throne. And this enormous fat queen in net and chiffon crawled up on that thing and said, that's my throne, I miss Winston-Salem. And this little pimply butt boy that had his cheeks hanging out of his leather chaps and a leather vest, he's Mr. Winston-Salem. I, I had to hold him yeah, on. I said, we're leaving. But we've He's never been back. Like, yeah. So I, they said, no, you, he said, you can't leave. I just, I can. Just watch him. I'm going to walk right over here. And he said, no, 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 no. We, we committed to this. We have to do it. So, so they set the four of us on, a, on those little chairs. All these folding chairs. At, at the feet of this big throne. And I thought, this is not the message that I was trying to get across. We'll never do this again. And so 
I, that killed it. So we've not been in, in, in the parade, in the parade since. Well, we already go. We don't even go to see it. Yeah, but I mean, and some of us are we just a self-hating homosexual? I'm not a self-hating homosexual. I just I think that we have progressed enough now where we need to be amongst all kinds of people. I said we need to find allies. When you're a minority, you need to find allies. And the only way you're going to find allies is to talk to them and let them see who you are and answer any kind of questions you have. And a lot of people will just turn away, but some people will understand and said, you've got to build allies. So we, uh, members of the Unitarian Church, and they want us to go around talking about things. And I said, I will, we will go only on the, on the case that you let me let us form a committee. We want to call the committee Accepting Allies. And we want straight people, we want non-gay people who are going to be supportive. And that's what we want. And they did they allow that. So we went around all the different kind of uh, Unitarian churches in the whole Southeast talking about marriage equality, why it's important, and had, had talked back after the sermons. And we made a lot of friends. But that's how you change minds. You know, not by walling yourself off in a silo, but getting out there talking to people. Uh, also, also, when we were doing that, we used our own car. We drove to wherever we, it was going to happen. We stayed like in your home, so it was the hotel bill. And the honorarium that you paid, you did not pay to us. You paid to the Unitarian Universal Association. And we turned it back into Charlotte, so it was a win-win-win. So this was with a, uh, a black female heterosexual uh, head of the, of the group. She left. She became an ordained minister. I was going to, to minister for school. And we got this white female lesbian to come in. And she said, you know, we just don't need you as a committee because... We need to put you on the Speaker's Bureau. Well, on the Speaker's Bureau, you automatically jump up to three or $400 for the weekend. And then they got to pay for all your, all your lodging and everything. So it's we didn't have to get booked. She, 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 she shut, shut us down. down. She shut us down. It's not our we own. are our own worst enemies. Yeah. We always are. Anyway. So anyway. But that's it. I mean, I don't know what else to say now, honey. You could, you could tell us what... <laughs> Ask us some questions. Okay. Uh, well, let's. We, we covered a lot there. Um, let's jump back a little bit. Do you guys um, have any memory of the Stonewall riots? Oh, yeah. 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 We were together doing the Stonewall riots. Yeah. Can you talk a bit about um, where you were and how you heard about it? And we, were in Atlanta. we were living in Atlanta, and we uh, the New York Times had a headline and something about. Bees, busy bees sting are stinging. You know, they're kind of I thought it was kind of tacky anyway, but it was it was dismissive of the whole idea, and I thought, well, I said, this this I think this is something important, but I really don't know what is going to happen, because at that time you were you were hiding, you were in hiding, like like you were some uh, thief in the night, you were hiding from the real world, so I didn't know what was going to happen. I don't know. I said. I, I, I see the black civil rights movement. I see when they have marches, they dress up in suits and ties, and they're very dignified, and they have a message that they're all on the same message. And I said, I don't know that gay people can follow that without diverging with all kinds of sections. I said, I don't know what's going to happen. So we, we just, we said, they, let, let's see what happened. And so uh, now we, then we went back for the 25th anniversary of the, in New York, oh yeah, and they, my God, there must have been a million people. I mean, they just went on for the. For they had a gay flag that was so long you had to pay for the right to volunteer to carry part of it. Yeah, but, I mean, and then, <laughs> then it became a thing. It became and and and, and I, I didn't like that because then well, it became a thing. But anyway, we we just we just want to see this go ahead. You know, we're getting we're getting near the end of our lives, but the young people coming up. And they've never experienced the kind of things we've experienced. I don't think they really realize how much has changed. Uh, and, In such a short time. Yeah, and it really has. I mean, you compare to other civil rights movements. I mean, the women's civil rights are still going on. They're still trying to interfere in women's lives and tell them what they can do, what they can't do. 
Yeah, so that's even going on now. So Off camera, I'll give you a solution to that. <laughs> <laughs> I I won't do no, that you can tell them. You can tell them. I came up with. I came up with this, that they should have fetal transplants. So these people who don't want this woman to have an abortion, they should have the baby put into them, let them carry the term and raise it. Which I, I think the reason they're against abortion is they want to have people grow up so they can put capital punishment. Oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> because every Republican that you know oh, no, no, is, no, 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 is no, no, for no, abortion. No, here we go. Don't, don't, don't. I have my right to have my opinion. Oh, here we go. Here we go. We, we can edit this out. <laughs> <laughs> don't you edit it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think the... Another thing, we, when we, we had this enormous house on Morningside in, in uh, Piedmont. And I, I don't know how familiar you are with Atlanta, but as you're going down Piedmont, it's this big yellow brick house that's way up on the hill. Oh, everybody knows it, of course. You know. yeah, of course you do. And yeah. the lights have been on since we sold Yeah, of course. Of course. They, they've never turned the lights oh, on. Yeah. But anyway, shut up. <laughs> Spousal abuse. Anyway, we had, a lot of, we, had a lot, we, had, we had a lot of gay friends in Atlanta. And we had a lot of these young gay guys that were from little small towns outside of Atlanta, and they would call and say, "Can I can I stop by and change to go to the bars to Atlanta in Atlanta and spend the night?" And we'd have you know four or five spend of the night, they'd just be on the floor wherever they could get. Almost every one of them died of AIDS, and we they would. We were we were I guess we were promiscuous before the AIDS really came out. But then we had settled down, and uh, it's that really hurt, that really hit us bad. The AIDS crisis. When yeah. did you first hear or learn about AIDS? It was in the well, was, yeah, I was at the post office that day, and, yeah. and somebody came up to me and told me about a really good friend of ours who had caught the gay cancer. That's what they were calling it then. And this is before it was even named AIDS, and. Uh, the, the thing that really upset us both, it, it caused us to spend a good deal of money uh, drawing up uh, medical powers of attorney, uh, durable powers of attorney, uh, wills, because we've, we saw so many people uh, where it was a couple and they had a house that, uh, and maybe the house was in one guy's name or one woman's name because they had more income, so they qualified more. They hadn't redeeded it, because you could always redeed it. But the family would come in and say, oh, all that's my, all that's my son's, yeah. I, re I was with him when he bought it. But no, no, you weren't. But the police would take the family's word over. We know of a case where the family came to console the guy that was still living. Their son was dead. While the sister took him out for a walk, to help him grieve, the family emptied the house, took the dog, and left. Yeah, even took the pet. Now that's good Christian people. So, I just it was it was it was a terrible terrible period. It was a terrible time. Terrible, terrible. And you would see somebody, and they would look normal. Then you would see them in a couple of weeks. He said, "Did you notice so and so? They don't really look that good. They look like they're sick." And then you would see them in another couple of weeks, and they were just almost a skeleton of themselves. And the next thing you know, you were the memorial. Yeah, but what, what, what was horrible was the people's way how they dealt with it. I mean, because uh, we, have, we knew of a case where this person with HIV went in the pool, mm -hmm. and the man found out about it. They emptied the pool of all the water and made him leave. They terminated his lease and made him leave. I mean, you go to the hospital and you put on these hazmat suits mm -hmm. and, and there was no physical contact. You couldn't touch anybody or hug them. I mean, it was horrible. But, but the, it was, the fear was palatable. But God bless the Roman Catholic priests that stood outside the hospital to give them their last rites but wouldn't go in and get close to them. Yeah. So I mean, that really turned my stomach and... It turned me against yeah. a lot of things. So that, we did a lot of volunteer work with Aid Atlanta and Gary worked in the office and we raised funds and we had, uh, we helped arrange for Elton John to come to a concert at Piedmont Park. Patty LaBelle. Patty LaBelle uh, to raise funds for that. And so we, they, well, we did, so we, they, did we, they did video, they did promos yeah. that they would pay. If the TV station 
would not run it free. They would pay to have it run, these two people, Elton John and Pedro Bell. But it was for age walks. And the name of your walk had to be the age walk. And I contacted the winter walk in Greensboro. I don't know, we're not changing the name. The name's always been the winter walk. But you can, Patty LaBelle, Elton John, they will advertise for you for free. They will get people that never would come out. They may even come to the walk just to, to, to welcome people. No, no, we're not changing the name. They never changed the name. Yeah. But I don't it, even know, do they still walk? Yeah, yeah. But it was, it was a horrible time. It was a horrible time. It really, it was, I mean, people just kind of were afraid to, to meet everybody. I mean, it was so strange. Even though we were monogamous, we still, I mean, they would, they would back away. You know, and it was, it was horrible, just mm -hmm. absolutely horrible. Horrible. Mm -hmm. And when we moved here, you know, we thought uh, it was a little different. But it, it, even here, there was a lot of problems, mm -hmm. which we didn't know about. Was, uh, I was born in the South, raised in the South, and there's this mentality that it doesn't matter how old you are, if you live at home and go to church on Sunday with mother, you're not gay. <laughs> doesn't matter what you do on Friday night, Saturday night, if you go to church with mother on Sunday, you're saved. You're, you're, yeah. <laughs> That's true. And maybe true, I don't know. Mm, okay. I, I have been there. I've lived that. Uh, but now, one, one of the blessings of living here was we discovered the School of the Arts. Yeah. And we really got involved with School of the Arts. We joined a lot of committees, a lot of work. And we even, we have a Frank and Gary Endowed Scholarship the School of the Arts. For gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender students and their accepting allies. Mm -hmm. allies. So it's, it's everybody. Mm -hmm. But we wanted that. We're the only one in the school that had that. But we wanted to do that. We wanted to pay back a little they bit. Had, they had scholarships for pig farmers' daughters from Surrey County. <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't have anything for gay kids. Right. Know, so. so we wanted to do that. But So that was kind of leaving our legacy. So I'm not going to use this person's name, but one of, our, one of our first recipients was a very talented young guy. He went to New York, and he came back to do a play here in town. And we took him out to lunch on his... Yeah, a young black kid. Yeah. Well, but I told the story. I'm sorry, excuse that. me. I'm sorry. Oh, you God. ruined the plot. Oh, God. <laughs> so anyway, we took him to West Sea Cafe and had lunch, and he's getting ready to uh, go back to New York. And it's, we paid the bill, and we tell him goodbye. He got up, and he hugged us, and he said, you know, when I was a poor black child growing up in lower Louisiana, I sure didn't know I was going to ever have friends like you. You know, old, white, rich, and gay. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a good kid. That needs to be a title of an autobiography. <laughs> yeah. That should be. It should be. That's our, that's our order. Yeah. How many uh, students have you supported with, with that uh, scholarship? Well, we will host family to one student for three years. Yeah, yeah. But and I, he, I, he was a ballet yeah. Yeah, but see, our, our, our scholarship just started paying just out. Just started paying out okay. because you have to endow it. So right. you, you pay so much each, a year and it sort of builds up. And then you have no control over who, I mean, they choose. Uh, yeah. But so we've actually had the, the student that we have now was the third student, but this is the second year we've had him. And we went to the person that does the scholarships and we said, You said you have a hard time giving our scholarship money out because you force the kids to self-identify. All they have to self-identify is an accepting ally. They don't have to say they're gay. They don't have to say they're a lesbian. If they do, that's great, but they, they don't. every one of them has been gay. Uh, but we went to this woman, we said, we like this guy. He's very, very talented. He seems to have his head on, on his shoulders good. We would like to ensure that he gets the scholarship as long as he's in school here, and he's making his grades. And so I think we'll have him for the third year next year. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, then, it, well, of course, at the end of the fourth year, he'll be graduating and going somewhere else, and we'll have another kid. Yeah. I mean, it's not a gigantic scholarship, it's not, you know, but it helps. Mm -hmm. And they can stack them, they can mm -hmm. get multiple scholarships, so that's good. And someday, after we're gone, it might be worth more money. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, because we have no control over how it's invested. We have no control over who gets it, which is fine. That's fine. But at least we have an endowed scholarship at the schools. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's our, that's our or believing to the world. Mm -hmm. Give us some more questions. Okay. Uh, so we've gone through the 80s in Atlanta with, with the AIDS epidemic, mm -hmm. and you mentioned when you moved here in 1993, there were a lot of challenges. Can you speak a little bit about those? Well, moving here? Mm -hmm. Well, I think I told you about how unwelcome we were when mm -hmm. we first moved in there. And, uh, but we just decided just to be ourselves. And so we just, uh, we would write and we would be very visible. And apparently this upset a lot of people. Well, when we were moving up here, two gay guys that we knew that worked at Wachovia said, now you have to understand, living oh, yes. in Winston is different from living in Atlanta. You have to have two phones in your house. One for each of you. Because you don't want Frank's boss calling and Gary answers the phone. <gasps> oh, that would be terrible. And then you can't go out together. What you do is you have... Now, we've only had one car together, our whole life together. We have, we're have we one car family. So he said, you have to go to different to a restaurant in different cars. And you, walk, you, you get to the lobby about and say, oh, are you eating here tonight? I didn't know you were eating here tonight. And make a big production out. So everybody knows that you just ran into each other and you can go to the table to eat. I mean, so we're not going to live like that. So are you out of your mind? But I mean, that was a mentality at least in 93 and at least with these people. Yeah, right, these people. Yeah. So go forward a couple of years. We are in the bed. It's 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning. The phone rings. And they need to speak to Frank, and I give him the phone. And he said, will you take me to Charlotte now? Yeah. Let me get the dog in the car, and we'll go. So I go to Charlotte. A bank branch had been struck by lightning. It was on fire. And they were having to do and He was risk manager for the bank. So I go way over in the corner of the parking lot after I let him out. The dog and I are fighting there, taking a little nap, and Hear this tapping on the window. I looked up and it's a security guard. He says, Sir, all the other men are in the bank meeting now. I said, oh, That's okay. I don't work for the bank. I'm Mr. Benedetti's driver. <laughs> <laughs> he got called in. <laughs> they had a security. He says, Who authorized a chauffeur driver? <laughs> I said, It was Gary, for God's sake. <laughs> and he used to push really hard for uh, uh, domestic partner benefits. Yeah, I, mean, I would cut articles out and send it to HR and I would forward emails about things. And I'm So he, he tried to get them to cover me a flu shot one year. And they just wouldn't hear it. He said, well, as I understand, they would do it for spouses and children, but they wouldn't do it for me. Well, the whole idea was that you wanted to protect your employee from getting the flu, so you gave it to the whole household. So, I mean, so I found out how you could go to the county and get it for free anyway. So I went to the county, got it, and, I, and then this woman called and she says, Frank, tell Gary to go get the shot and I'll pay for it. He said, thank you very much, but he's already got one and it didn't cost anything. We just wanted to prove a point. And she's still our friend. Yeah, and, and anyway, when they merged with First Union, the head of HR called me up, you can stop sending me these articles because First Union does have domestic partner benefits and we're going to copy their program. And, and when, uh, you may have to edit this out. <laughs> when, when he was fighting for domestic partner benefits, one of the big wigs in HR was a gay man and he told Frank, we're only doing what the government makes us do. We are not going in this direction. I was furious. But anyway, <laughs> but, but I mean, you know, you, you go through life and you keep pushing and pushing and, and knocking yourself out. And then you reach a point where it's, okay, I've done this. Jim, I've got to just stop. Jim, we kept getting, the, 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 can we come back to, to today? Sure. We kept getting these uh, things in the mail. Join us for, for dinner. Join us for lunch. 
come see, and I'm not going to name the name of the place, but come see us at this place for retirement. You see why we have no secrets. <laughs> so we go, and we have lunch, and uh, it was right at our 50th anniversary, and we had gone to New York, and two straight women forced us to get married. They wouldn't let us come back till we got married. It's a shotgun wedding. And uh, we had a big 250 people at the Unitarian Church. Uh, we raised ten thousand dollars for our scholarship that night. Yeah, we said in lieu of gifts, make a contribution to the school. And so we get this phone call, and this lady says, "Oh, I was so happy that y'all came to lunch today, and uh, you seem to be so interested. I'd like to give you a private tour." So he says, "Yeah, they got your number." I said, "No, let's go." So we go. The lady sitting at the registration desk has this big banner behind her. I mean, huge. It says, Happy 50th Anniversary, Frank and Gary. <laughs> he said, they've got our number. So we go through, we see everything. We go through apartments, which are very depressing because you got to get past all the wheelchairs and the walkers. Uh, but then we go down to the bungalows, and the bungalows are beautiful. The bungalows are really nice. So... $500,000 to buy in, $5,000 a month for the two of us to live there. And you don't own it. You don't own it. You $500,000 gives you the right to live there. And no, poor, of course, part of it's only like two fifty. dollars so. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> here's where they made their mistake. Frank looked to me, and then he looked at this lady. He said, you know, we really need to go home and figure out, do some, do some figuring and see if we could really afford this. I was trying to be gracious. And she said, oh, trust me, you can afford it. We've already checked. And I said, we're leaving. So then we, we pulled out and we came over here and saw some places that were, and we said, well, if we could, if we could build and make changes, See, this is only one like this. It's in the whole complex. On the inside. On the inside. You can't mess with the outside. But we changed walls and we did we did a lot of changes. Well, but uh, We made it into a, a one bedroom. And we've told our families that if you want to come visit, there's a hotel down the street and we will pay for it. <laughs> we'll pay for it. And it's a win-win because you'll have your own privacy you have your, in your room and we'll have ours. But How it's a one bedroom. That home here? And so that, then that, and we do that. We do do that. We do do that. But this is us. And this is this is a. The next time we move, we'll either be in a box, or we'll be so heavily medicated that we know that we're being taken. But we moved in here. We had not even begun to unpack, and the doorbell rang. Oh crap! I said, are they, <laughs> do they have crosses? <laughs> are they carrying torches? <laughs> so we, we, we figured people said, what are you doing here? You're not going But we opened the door and this lady, really dear lady, become a really good friend. She says, I don't want to interrupt you. I know you're busy. She had a bottle of wine in her hand. She said, but you're going to have to take a break. You need to sit down and just chill out. So we'll talk to you later. So within a week, we were invited to their house for dinner. When I was in the hospital last week, Two weeks ago, I was in the hospital for a full week. The couple behind us and another couple said he was too emotionally distraught to drive. So they formed carpools to bring him back and forth to the hospital to see me. That's incredible. He ate at a different person or their, or their mostly their house, but somebody fed him every night I was in the hospital. Yeah, they brought him lunch. I mean, th this is amazing, dude. We we, uh, we decided to do a, a, a Valentine's Day. We decided <laughs> everybody's been so kind here that we're going to have a party at the clubhouse, a thank you party for the wonderful people here who have been so kind and generous to us. And we figured 20, 30 people would come. Well, we were wrong. Not over 90 people showed up. The, the night before the party, yeah. I said, Frank... We gotta we, go buy more. <laughs> we gotta go tomorrow morning and buy some more wine and some more food. So we did, we did. But it was over ninety people came. It was wonderful. But anyway, I gotta tell you a story about the our first house. We went we moved in, I told you about how that they're not they wanted to take a petition up. Some did, not everybody. Just first some. house here in first, Woods. Yeah. And so we uh, a neighbor a neighbor called came by and said it is a tradition to have 
a family Christmas to get together in our neighborhood. And it's a, we bring a covered dish and then lock a hole. Their children are, are, are encouraged to come. And it might give you a chance to really get to meet your neighbors. So we yeah, said, okay, Julie does two hours. Yeah. And I said, okay, so we go. So we made the cat went down there and we walked in there and people just looked at us. I mean, you, they, we just sat there, stood there, and they just looked at us. And they weren't ugly. They weren't ugly, but they, they did. You just didn't know what to say. So it was like two hours of silence. <laughs> so we left there, and I said, you know, we have to do something about this because we're going to be living here. We're going to do something about it. So let's have the next one at our house, but let's do it our way. <laughs> so we went online. We got all their addresses. We sent out engraved invitations. Open bar, uh, catered, pianist, and just come. But no children, children. No children. Okay. So we had all this set up in this big house, and time came, and there wasn't a person to be seen. And I said, oh my God, we have all this food and all that. I looked out the door, and there was a mob coming down the street. I mean, a mob. And I said, well, they don't have tiki torches. They don't have. <laughs> <laughs> I said, so baby, they would not come individually. They had to come. They in met mass. at another house. And so they came in mass. So I open the door, and this woman walks in, and she looks around. She says, "Oh my God, this is like a real home." <laughs> so I said, "Please walk in, help yourself. There's an open bar there. We got a pianist playing music." Walk around, the food's over there. You, you want to go upstairs, look at the bedrooms, go ahead. Look at, look at anything you want to look Let's at. Open any doors you want to see, it's, it's free. One o'clock in the morning, I was throwing people out. Drunks. Drunks. But but that was it. I mean, there was no other, they never had another Christmas party. It, it was a Christmas party. <laughs> but they, they never, we never saw anybody else again socially, ever, in the whole 25 years we were there. But I mean, I just laugh at it. I, but what in the world does she think, you know? But that's the whole purpose of this, is to put yourself out there and talk to people and show them who you are. Not everybody's going to like you, but you, you just show them who you are. We go, we go on trips with Ronaldo House. We go on trips with uh, the opera. Uh, we're the only gay couple there. We, I know there are other gay people there, but they're not openly gay. I mean, their, their wives are there or whatever. But anyway, uh, and, and it's amazing the number of people that open up. We went, we went to New York for the opera in January 2014. These two women said, you, you, you're not coming back and when? Well, the head of the opera uh, group that took us up there the night before we got married, we were eating dinner in this restaurant, in this long, long table. It's about 20, 30 people. Mm -hmm. And he ding, 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 ding on the glass. He says, many of you may not know, and Frankie Gary probably don't even know, but this is the closest thing to a rehearsal dinner they will ever have. And this, these are all straight people. These are, these are all heterosexual. Toasted. And they toasted us. And this couple, I won't name their names because... I shouldn't, I guess. Uh, opera singers from, that live in the triad that had been with the Met for years sang to us. Another young, another young opera singer from the school sang to us. The next day we had the wedding. A beautiful reception. We have no idea who paid for yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> we, I kept waiting on them to bring me the bill. <laughs> Somebody paid for it. Yeah. But but this is extraordinary. We were the only gay people... Well, there was one or two, I think, were, were gay. We were predominantly the only gay people at that wedding. And it's, it's been wonderful. Yeah, this, that's what, so, I mean, we have a special place. And then we uh, we came back and we went to an older house because we're also members oh, of an older house. I that. And uh, they had a, 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 a Martin Art crying. exhibit playing there. Yeah. You better talk. Yeah, okay. he'll start crying. Uh, anyway, Elizabeth Chu was a curator at the time there. And she was from... Uh, her mother and my biological father were from the same hometown in Georgia. 
And so she said, I, I need you guys to come over and let me explain this stuff to you because you didn't seem to really enjoy the exhibit when you saw it. So we went over and she's explaining to us uh, about the different things that we still don't like. Well, but then it was, on, it was on, on Monday when they, they were closed. Yeah. So it was a private mm -hmm. viewing. And so, so we, we, it was private. Yeah. So he said, well, thank you very much, but we need to leave out. She said, oh, you can't go until uh, I take you back here because there's a couple of people that want to see you. And when we went back there, the whole staff was there with champagne, cupcakes, and all. And uh, Natalie Broyhill had written, Frank and Gary, Frank and Gary, had to go to New York to marry. <laughs> I can't remember the other words. But they all sang the song. It was very sweet. Yeah. And uh, so we've been very fortunate, very lucky here. Uh, and I know it's because we don't make money, but... You know, you, you got to do something. To, but uh, we've been very fortunate that the different groups uh, have, have responded to us. That's how we got to have uh, lunch with Timothy Redmond. Because they were afraid we wouldn't be able to be at the concert because I was, I was really getting sick. And so, I mean, that's, we love living here. Mm -hmm. We really do. really do. It's a great little town. We had planned to move to Greensboro, but we never did. <laughs> well, in 93, there were no restaurants downtown. Right. So we used to drive to Lucky 32, and oh, what's the one on Elm Street? Or, or, the Undercurrent. Undercurrent. Mm -hmm. And we had all these restaurants, and we'd, we would drive, get in the car and drive to Greensboro to eat. We, we used to go to, to Durham, yeah. to Nana's and Magnolia Grill yeah. for dinner. Yeah. Because what was we had the Rainbow Grill. Did you ever eat the Rainbow Grill? Rainbow Grill was on Broad Street in Brookstown. Mm -hmm. So we go in, and we're sitting out on the, in the patio, and he ordered uh, a hot meal, and I ordered a seafood burrito, and he got his food, and it's okay. And I got my food, and I said, hmm. So the waitress comes by, she said, Well, how's your food, Chuck? <laughs> That's it. He said, It was fine. And I said, Well, you know. I never would have thought of serving this chill. She said, chill? I said, yeah, look at this ice on it. And she said, oh shit, hun, they forgot to nuke it. <laughs> and she grabbed the plate up and she ran to the microwave and she zapped it. And she brought it back, she said, that should be better. And I looked at him and I said, we got to be eating at home an awful lot. Because <laughs> we didn't know any better. We didn't know. Right. And now I asked somebody, I said, well, where do the people go ahead and eat? I said, well, most of the people either belong to a country club or it's a private club or they go to Applebee's. And I said, that's it? And I said, well, well that's Atlanta know. where there was thousands of restaurants. That's it? And I said, okay. So we used to, we used to drive to Greensboro. It was funny. Um. Can you speak a bit about the difference in climate in Winston-Salem versus Greensboro for LGBT people? The social climate? Mm -hmm. well, I I I, I, well, I think our experience in Atlanta was, first of all... Did she talk about Greensboro versus Winston-Salem? Greens oh, yeah, Greensboro versus Winston-Salem. Well, we thought, we figured that most of the things that were emanating, there was such a thing as a gay business guild. Mm -hmm. The that, triad business. Yeah, yeah, that met it in there. And so we were amazed that that was there. That we had that in Atlanta, but we didn't have it here. And then we found out. So we noticed that all the people who were progressive seemed to be coming from Greensboro. And the people in Winston seemed to be very, very closeted and very secretive. And so we talked about us moving to Greensboro. <laughs> but that was it. But we just found there were more, more organizations emanating from Greensboro than emanating over here. And well, when we joined the Triad Business Guild, yeah. we, we enjoyed it. It was very good. We, we, we went every month. And then some women wanted to pass um, a rule that you had to have it as a safe space so there could be nobody there but gays or lesbians. Well, if, if his sister's visit or my sister's visit, I want to be able to bring them. We're not ashamed of who we are. Well, plus it defeats the whole purpose. I mean, I'm, I'm making connections. And, mm -hmm. and, and there are people that we know that their parents would come with them. I mean, prominent people in, in Greensboro. Uh, and 
we said, no, we can't be part of a group that does this. So, uh, the guy that was president at the time w w worked around on it. And they, they said, no, we're not going to do this. You, and half the women left the guild. And half of those half will not speak to us to this day. If they see us at a restaurant or in a movie theater or whatever, they'll just turn around and walk away because we were in the guild for them. But we were trying to make it more inclusive of everyone. I mean, we've never been ashamed of who we are, not with our friends, our, our workers, co-workers, or our family. So why should we hide there? It just doesn't make sense. But see, we were, we were contrary to what was established routines here. And so that, that caused a lot of friction. <laughs> and, 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 and Greensboro seemed to be more progressive. I don't know that it is now with Innovation Quarter coming in here and uh, a lot of other things opening up. A lot of young people. I never thought that there would be uh, million dollar condos in downtown Winston. And so we were, uh, we're not leaving here. We can't afford it. <laughs> we're going to die right here. But uh, <clears throat> Parade of Homes had in the lofts across from uh, Stevens Center on the, on the uh, Parade of Homes. So one of them was like 700,000 and one was like 900,000. I said, I gotta go see what this is. And he said, well, you, we're not gonna, we're not gonna move. I said, I don't mean move, let's just go look. So we go in there, it's about half the size of this. And I said, oh, I see the apartment number down here on the ground. Then I looked out the window and said, oh, so you get a space under the building and a space outside? And he said, oh no. For seven hundred and seventy thousand dollars, you only get a space outside. Now I'm gonna park my car outside after I paid almost three quarters of a million dollars for a place. First of all, I'm gonna pay them. <laughs> so I mean, and, and it's almost sold out. Yeah. So who knows? Who knows? Um, so one thing we haven't quite covered is. Okay. Um, North Carolina has had a lot of uh, legislation, legislation, LGBT, anti-LGBT legislation yeah. that has kind of given it and um, the state an anti-LGBT identity that you have all been fighting against. Right. Well, really, truly, we didn't have it until McCrory became governor, and we were at uh, the, the Giannini Society. I don't know if you know, that's the it's part of the School of the Arts. And a whole bunch of us went down to Charlotte to uh, have dinner and go to the theater because some alums were in the production. And this retired lawyer in his 90s sat down next to me and he says, you know what, I hate that damn HB2. I said, I do too. He said, yeah, it cost our governor his job. And he was doing a damn good job. He's a fine man. I said, well, you know, HB2 did not cost your governor his job. Your governor's ego cost him his job because he had enough Republicans in the state house that if he had vetoed it, they would have overridden the veto and he would have come off like a savior saying, I tried to stop them, but they overrode me. But no, he had to go and sign it in because his ego. He said, ego? Why in the hell am I sitting here? I said, I don't know, but I'm sitting here first and I ain't moving, so you better just go on. <laughs> but uh, Georgia, I mean, look at Georgia there with the abortion thing. It, it's always got to be somebody that, that wealthy old people try to put down. Uh, we were at the uh, Presbyterian Church here. Oh, I can't remember the name of it now. But we had met, God, what was his name? The, the sailor that got killed by his uh, shipmates. And we met his mother. Uh, this young sailor was in Japan, and some of his shipmates found out that he was gay. He was done open. And they beat him to death. They beat him to death in the, ba in the public bathroom yeah. in downtown Tokyo. And we met his mother in D.C. at the HRC thing. So obviously, we're the right ones to be on this panel. <laughs> So we were talking about, you know, the, the hate. Well, why do you, why do you hate so bad? And this elderly black man stood up and he said, "Son, 
20, 30 years ago, you would have been me. I, I was right where you are. And the only thing that's going to save you is for them to find somebody to hate more than they hate you. And that's really true. And that's sad. We're supposed to be a, a true Christian country. Uh, we'll, we'll rebuild Notre Dame for the Catholic Church, but you think we'll help some little pregnant girl that uh, needs some folk food and clothing? Oh, no, she, she brought that. But if, if it's in a foreign country, we'll go over there and do it. Uh, don't get me started. <laughs> you already started. <laughs> Um, so you touched a little bit on it earlier, but can you speak to the generational difference between LGBT people back of your time versus the younger generation today? Yeah. Well, I think I can. I mean, I, our experience has been that the younger generation is, is much more, as, as a whole, are much more open. They're, are more, they're not boxed in and they're willing to, to talk and, and experience things. A lot different than, than our generation. Our generation tended to be very closeted and, and they have guilt ridden about who they were. And they would, these people, kids, these kids are very brave. I mean, you look, look at some of these kids that are, that were, that survived that Parkland's uh, shooting. I mean, they just going around the country speaking up against gun control. I mean, for gun control, rather. So I, I just think that the younger generation, I have a lot of hopes. That the younger generation will over will just keep right on going and pick up where we left off and take it forward. I really I really believe that, but there's still a lot to overcome. I mean, you can just look and see the papers every day. There's something going on. This doesn't make any sense. I mean, they try to do the Equality Act, and every Republican voted except I think five voted against it. You know, what is there to be voting against? You know, so well I, you I, have here one re representative from here that stood up and said. The Matthew Shepard murder was a hoax. It was just staged to, to get sympathy. Yeah. I mean, so yeah. you, you, you're you dealing with that. So you know I, that was. I, I just feel that, <laughs> that, that mm -hmm. uh, I have great hopes that the younger generation will, will lead us forward and uh, go for But it, we may not be around to see the results of it, but we, I'm, I'm very hopeful about that. So I feel good about that. And just talk to because we go to these different schools and talk to the kids in the classes, and they're really sharp, and, and they're really smart, and they ask great questions, and they, they seem to want to know. And I, I like that. I like that a lot. So I, I'm, I'm very hopeful about that. And is there anything um, that we didn't cover today that you'd like to talk about? <laughs> no, I, th I think we kind of laid out our lives to you. I mean, our, just to sum it, summarize it, we have never felt that we were doing anything wrong. We never felt we had a reason to have to hide. And the only resistance we ever got was from other gay people. Right. And, and I and I and I just think that we need we need to be building allies. We need to be going across. I, I admire. Uh, I call we call him Mayor Pete. Yeah. For going on Fox News, now he he got a lot of grief about that. But that's what we need to do. We need to go into these people's realms and be yourself and be polite and answer questions or be attacking name calling. Just just show up and and, and give him your presentation. And we understand that he got a standing ovation from the Fox uh, audience, mm -hmm. which is astounding. So, I mean, that's, that's very hopeful to me. So we, we're hoping that this younger generations will just let, let us old white guys die off him. <laughs> I coming. beg your pardon. <laughs> but now, I will say one of the things I'm most proud of and, and, and really am very, very happy it happened. We got a beautiful letter for our 50th anniversary from our friends, Michelle and Barack Obama. I mean, it's, I don't believe it's just a form letter, and it may be, but if it is, it's a form letter that's tailored to fit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I've, we kept that, we've got that framed. Uh, we've got mementos framed throughout the house. Yeah, we got a picture of the, of the billboard. And we put that up, and got the first picture ever taken of us in, in 1963. You, you wouldn't recognize. You wouldn't well, recognize. You might. That. You might recognize yeah. what's left. No, no. <laughs> but I mean, but I, I think the main thing is that we try to look for positive things. We try to look each day as you know, what can we do? And we want. We're very focused on trying to leave something behind, uh, because we have no children, so we want to. We want to do something behind and. 
we just we just we don't like people we like talking to people mm -hmm. and I don't understand why people are, I just want to hide and pretend I don't I can't grasp that but my generation was like that you know I mean yeah you have, you have even famous people like uh, uh, Joel Gray you know here he is married and he comes out at 75 I mean hello who cares yeah I mean <laughs> so you, you live 75 years you know and, and, and a lie and live adversely and, and, yeah and you cheated on your wife you know I mean what, what that's, nobody lives anyway. I, I'm just I'm just, I'm so proud of this new generation. I'm sure there are some idiots too. I mean I understand that, but but I'm still I'm very happy about it. All right. Well, thank you for speaking with us today. Oh, well, thank you for asking us. Thank you for asking us. You can have a hard time editing. I just really, this is looking down to a five minute.